Well, hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining our admissions webinar about gaining admission to the Jindal School of Management here at the University of Texas at Dallas. I'm Dr. Monica Powell. I'm the Senior Associate Dean, and I'm thrilled to have so many folks here who are thinking about and considering making an application to one of our many graduate degree programs. I hope you enjoyed that montage of pictures that came just before me. Get a real sense of what it feels like to be here at the University of Texas at Dallas, and I hope that we can entice you to complete your application and apply by getting all the critical answers you need to the application process, scholarships, and if you're an international student, those answers as well. So let me introduce the crew that's with us here for the admissions uh, webinar today. We've got Karina Cantua. She's the Director of Advising Operations. Karina and her wonderful team of advisors help students with everything from enrollment to degree planning to graduation and making sure you fulfilled all the course requirements. And then we also have Josephine Vita. Her and her magical team of individuals from the International Students and Scholars Office really do a great job of helping our international students manage the nuances of gaining admission as an international student. We have a fabulous agenda, and of course, you guys are the stars of our show. We want to make sure that the priority is answering your questions. But let's look at the agenda. We're going to cover application questions because sometimes there are complexities and, and students need clarification about certain aspects. We're going to address the all important scholarship questions um, that students have. We realize that financing and education is really important and you want to be sure to understand all of the deadlines and the rules around applying for scholarships. We are going to address program questions. Um, every program is unique at the graduate level here. We want to make sure that you, you understand uh, those answers. And then, of course, international student applicants. Um, there are a lot of important considerations for you, and so we want to make sure that Josephine and her team, um, that would include Elizabeth and Sarah, uh, who might join us in answering some of those questions in so that you know exactly what you're doing. But again, we don't want you to leave without your questions being answered, uh, and we'll make sure to address those at the very end of the presentation. So without further ado, I think it's time that I turn over the reins to Karina to address the all important application questions. Karina? Thank you, Dr. Powell. I'm happy to be here to help answer some of our most popular application related questions. I am actually ready to go. Norma, do we have the first question? Yes, the first question is, um, what is the application deadline and what is the difference between the early and regular application deadline? Sure thing. So the application deadlines are actually shown on the screen. What you see are what we call the regular application deadlines. So for the spring semester, the application deadline every spring is October 1st of the previous year. And then for the fall semester, uh, the deadline is actually May 1st. So those are the deadlines that you have to meet so that your application is not late. I do want to say that we encourage students to apply before those deadlines, especially when there's a lot of uh, steps or paperwork that you have to do after you're admitted to make sure that you can arrive on campus and start taking your classes. So don't see these as the deadlines you want to target. Uh, there is an early application deadline, uh, for example, for a fall term, that would be January 15th. You could sometimes see that maybe as your target deadline of, of to give yourself plenty of time after that to prepare to arrive and, and start taking your classes at UTD. But I do want to mention, and this is very important, it does not mean that if you miss that uh, early application deadline that you cannot apply. All right. If the January 15th deadline uh, you know, comes by, comes and goes, you can still submit an application for a fall term and we would definitely encourage you to do that. So please don't be discouraged if, if the early application deadline has passed, you can still apply for that uh, corresponding semester. Our next question is, do you offer GMAT GRE waivers and how do you apply for a GMAT GRE waiver? Yes, um, so during the pandemic, uh, because of the limitations and the access to the tests, uh, the committee was considering GMAT GRE waivers. Um, at this time, if you are interested in a GMAT GRE waiver, you will be able to find the details on our JSOM application website, or you can also send us an email to jsomgradvising at utdallas.edu, and we will be happy to provide you the information, more details about how that would work. 
Do I need to submit official transcripts and test scores with my admissions application? So no, um, the review committee will be able to make a decision on your file using unofficial copies of your transcripts, mark sheets, degree certs, and unofficial test scores. Uh, when you submit your application, we encourage you to upload those unofficial copies along with the application so that your application is ready for review a lot faster than doing it separately. Uh, one important thing to note on this though, and, and I believe Dr. Powell will probably touch on this, is that if you are interested in a scholarship, you will be required to submit official test scores. OK, so for review, uh, unofficial is OK, but if you're considering a scholarship, we will need official test scores for GMAT GRE. Do you offer a waiver for the English proficiency requirement? Yes, so on the screen you will see that the required minimum scores for the various English proficiency exams are accepted by the university. That's on the right hand side of what you see, uh, but it's important to see that there are exceptions to the requirement and on the main UTD admissions page, you're going to be able to see those two main waivers. Uh, the first one uh, is being if you're native to a country whose primary language is English. Uh, that includes Australia, Belize, India, Kenya, South Africa. Um, you can find the complete list of countries on that link on the admissions page. So that's the first way to waive. Uh, the second waiver is if you have completed a bachelor's or a master's degree through instruction and examination in English. Uh, if that you, then you would qualify for an English uh, waiver. Can I apply to more than one program? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you're interested in pursuing two programs, there is a benefit of working on both programs at the same time due to the potential reduction of total credit hours required. Uh, there may be some courses that overlap, so that would reduce the uh, total number of credit hours you need for both programs. If you're interested in the master's program and an MBA, so the, an MS and an MBA, you will actually find an application specific to that double MS MBA, so it'll be just one application for that. Um, if you're interested in two master's programs, so an MS and an MS, um, you, there's not a single application for that, but don't worry, uh, the application system actually makes it very uh, easy uh, to actually submit an application for both programs. Once you submit the application for the first one and you type in all the details for that application, when you start the second one, it will automatically populate any information that is the same. So you don't have to redo that part. Uh, there may be some questions that are new that you would have to fill in, but for the most part, everything will already be there for you. Uh, and the same thing will be true about your unofficial documents, what you upload, um, like your transcript, mark sheets, that's the same, that won't change. Uh, and we would be able to use it for both applications. So that makes things easier, even if you are submitting two separate applications. How long does it take to receive an admission decision after applying? So the normal processing time is about four weeks. Um, however, we will do everything we can to cut that time in half. We know that you want an answer as quickly as possible, so we're going to work very hard to make that happen for you. I do want to mention, though, that your application cannot move forward unless it's complete. So you have to make sure that you get us those supporting documents with your file for us to be able to move it forward to the review committee. If you don't, then we're going to be waiting on those documents and that's going to add time to the review process. What is the profile of the average admitted student? So um, the answer to this question will actually depend on the program, uh, but there's a very easy way to find out. Um, whenever you go to our school of management program information, the same place where you'll find the curriculum, uh, career outcomes, you're also going to find this uh, class profile, so a, a breakdown of the class profile, just like the sna uh, snapshots that are here on the screen. Uh, they're very nice, easy to read summaries, uh, and they will probably include the information that you're looking for. Thank you so much, Karina. Now we'll go to Dr. Powell for some questions about scholarship. Thanks again, Karina. Those were terrific answers to those very popular application questions. So Norma, I guess we ought to attack the next category, which are questions around scholarships. What's that first question about scholarships? Our first question is, what types of scholarships are available as a new student and as a continuing student? So that is a terrific question, and I realize um, that funding your graduate uh, degree is a really important consideration for, for really all applicants. So if you are interested in applying as a new incoming student, you can apply for the Dean's 
excellent scholarship for new incoming students. And all of those scholarships that we award uh, come with a tuition waiver um, and, and students should apply for that scholarship. It is a separate application that you complete and you should do that after you have been admitted to your degree program. Um, we, we have two times a year uh, when we award new student scholarships. We award them for the incoming spring semester and then we award them for the incoming fall semester. So those have uh, students have two opportunities. Now, one of the things that's really important is this screen that's actually uh, up there, the picture that Norma has for you. Um, and so please be mindful of the program that you have been admitted to. There are some programs that are not eligible to apply for the Dean's Excellence Award, and those are the ones that are listed below because all of those degree programs have their own scholarship uh, process and they are different depending upon which program you have been admitted to. So keep in mind that if you've been admitted in a semester and you have applied for the scholarship in a semester and you've been awarded a scholarship for a particular incoming semester, you can defer your enrollment, but you cannot defer your scholarship award. So I just want to make sure that people understand that. Um, that's because you're competing against all of those individuals that are applying for a particular incoming semester, which is why you can't defer a scholarship award. You can defer an admission, but you cannot defer a scholarship award. So I hope that answered that question, Norma. What's the next one? The next question is, what is the deadline to apply for scholarship? So for these new incoming Dean's Excellence, there's an acronym for Dean's Excellence Scholarship. It's called DES. You may hear us refer to a DES award. There are two different deadlines. If you are applying for spring admission, then you apply by December the 1st. If you're applying for fall admission, then you apply by May the 1st. It is really important that students understand that you must submit an official GMAT or GRE score. It must have been electronically sent to the university and sent by those two deadline days. So it's in the system for the scholarship committee to review an applicant. We will not look at an applicant unless an official test score is in the system. So don't wait until the last minute. It's horrible if your score comes in on May the 3rd and the scholarship committee uh, already addressed uh, the awardees before then. The other thing I just want to point out for, for students, applicants, is that the scholarship committee looks at applicants on a rolling basis. We look at the amount of money we have to spend and we award periodically throughout. So it is to your advantage to apply to a program early, to get it admitted to a program early, to have submitted your official GMAT and GRE score early, because, you know, as as every school out there, you know, it's not a, an endless bucket of money. So we're going to award the most competitive applicants first. If you apply early and you don't hear anything for a long time, it probably may be the result of not being quite as competitive as other students in um, in the pile. And we do have a limited number of awards that we can give every year, but we have a lot of scholarship money to give away. And that's one of the things we really pride ourselves on is being able to help uh, help our incoming uh, graduate students. Next is, am I eligible to apply for scholarship if my GMAT GRE was waived? So this is a really good question. You can be considered for admission uh, on, a, on a waiver of a score because your overall application had some strong qualities about it. Maybe you blew off the top of your undergraduate education or you've got other things that are within your profile that make you highly competitive and eligible for a waiver of a GMAT GRE. That's kind of an individual case by case basis. But for scholarships, it isn't an option. If you want to compete for a scholarship, you must submit an official GMAT or GRE uh, score and you must do it electronically and you must do it by the deadline. That means you go out to the, the Graduate Management Admissions Council uh, test website and have the score sent to us electronically for GMAT or you go out to ETS's uh, portal and request that it be sent to us electronically as well. Next question, um, what does the scholarship committee look for when awarding scholarship? Such a great question. You know, the, the process is very similar 
to what we do on the application side. We review candidates holistically, meaning we look at everything that a student has submitted in order to make that decision as to whether or not a student gets a DES or Dean's Excellent Scholarship Award. Um, it is tedious and it is hard, and our scholarship committee is really thorough in looking at all the applicants. We take this very, very seriously in the scholarship committee, just as we do in the admissions committee. When will I find out if I was awarded a scholarship? So Norm, I'm really glad um, that you asked this question because it is a rolling process, which means that we start looking at applicants as soon as we kind of have applicants to look at. And of course, we're looking for the most competitive candidates. So we start awarding early in the process and we award throughout the process until we run out of funds to award. So again, um, you want to be as competitive as you can. Um, so you should look at the, the degree program profiles, get a sense of how you are competitive to that profile, um, and then be very patient as the scholarship committee works through those candidates. Am I eligible for in-state tuition if awarded scholarship? So as an incoming new student, all of the DES awards give a tuition waiver scholarship. Now, obviously that does not apply to somebody who's in state, um, but if you are out of state, uh, out of country, and you're awarded the Dean's Excellence, you are given a tuition waiver, but only for two consecutive semesters not for an entire academic year. So if you come in in the fall, then you're getting it for fall and spring. If you're coming in in the spring, you're getting it for spring and summer. So it's basically two semesters in, in a row. And man, that is that looks really good to the bottom line in terms of the amount of money it saves you. You're given a $1,000 award that is applied to your first semester, and then the tuition waiver is applied to those two consecutive semesters. Now we have some questions about programs. Um, how many credit hours does the program take to complete? So if you're doing the MS program, it is 36 credit hours. Generally speaking, that is 18 hours of core courses and 18 credit hours of elective classes. Now keep in mind that many of our master's programs have tracks or concentrations. So that means that um, that you're able to sort of specialize your degree plan based upon the career outcome that you want. So the example on the screen is a good one. It's for business analytics. You see there are nine tracks that are available. So if you know that you want to go into a data science role, you may want to take those elective hours within the data science track. You're not required to have a concentration or a track, but I would strongly encourage you to do that because I think it makes you more easily identifiable to an employer that you are bringing a certain skill set to the table. So you want to really get in and look at your program pages, go and look at the tracks or co uh, concentrations that you have open as an option, and really think about what you want to do. You may even want to go out to something like indeed.com, Look at some job descriptions for somebody who's in a financial analytics role. See if that's the kind of work you want to do. You want to do your legwork up front. You don't want to wait until you've completed 18 core hours and then say, oh, what do I want to do with regard to my track or my concentration? You want to have an idea of that ahead of time because in some degree programs, you can start to take electives right off the bat and you want to have those electives uh, under your belt because those will help you be attractive to more uh, employers for internships as well. So look at the ITM, um, the um, Information Technology Management degree program. It has a lot of tracks. Look at business analytics, look at supply chain, look at management science, look at finance. They all have options for you to tailor your degree. And the more you know about where you wanna go, the quicker you can determine the concentration and track and the better you can kind of plan out your degree program. That's a great question, Norma. Thanks for asking that one. What is the estimated cost for the entire program? So this is a very complicated question, but I am going to do my very best to answer this and to direct you to where you can get 
even more detailed information about it. So on the university's uh, website, there is a, an, a, a cost estimator where you can put in you know, your status, whether you're graduate or undergraduate, when you're coming, you can put in the number of hours you're planning to take, and it will estimate for you what your tuition is going to cost. And it's going to estimate, in my opinion, on the high side, what your living expenses are going to be. Uh, everybody lives differently. Some people want to live alone in a, an apartment for one, and that's more expensive than living with four other people in an apartment with five. So you have to understand that some of those are estimates um, that are just generated by the algorithm associated with a calculator. Now, the other thing that is really important for you to think about and remember is the more credit hours you take in a semester, the less lesser the cost is per credit hour. Now, that doesn't mean you want to come in and take 18 credit hours in your first semester and 18 credit hours in your second semester because nine credit hours is a full-time load for a graduate student. So that's biting off a lot to just save the overall cost per tuition credit hour. But do keep in mind the university also has these tuition tables where you can go in, follow the links, you can look at the tuition table, and you can see, okay, if I take 13 credit hours this fall, what is that going to cost versus nine credit hours in the fall or 10? Now, remember, this is really important. As an incoming master's student, you are likely going to be taking 10 credit hours because in your first semester, you are also required to take professional development, which is a one credit hour course. So you're going to be enrolling in 10 credit hours in that first semester. So go in and fill out the cost of attendance questionnaire, use the calculator and get an estimate uh, in terms of what that's going to cost. Now the university you know, makes these estimates and that's going to be important when you're kind of going through the um, the I-20 process in terms of cost, because when you eventually go to do a visa appointment, you're going to have to prove that you have the funds to be able to study abroad. And, and Josephine and her team will be talking about that a little bit later in this presentation. But that's a great, a great complicated question, uh, Norma. Who should I contact if I have questions about the degree curriculum or career outlook for the program I am interested in? Wow, you know, we are a big school, my friends. We have uh, just under 4,000 graduate students and just over 4,000 undergraduate students. So this is a big, busy, exciting, and fun place to be. And we have a multitude of people that are available to you to help you with um, all kinds of questions. If you want to know more about your degree program, I am trying to choose between doing uh, management science with a concentration in finance or doing an MS in finance, or I'm trying to decide between doing the analytics masters or the concentration in analytics in the information technology management program. Those are great questions and it's important that you understand the differences in not only the degree program in terms of what it requires and the types of courses you will take, but really understanding what kind of career and job that uh, prepares you for. So if you have questions about the degree program, what's the difference between this course and that course? What is the diff difference between this track versus that track? How do I compare these two uh, degree programs to each other? What kind of job is that going to prepare me for? That is a question for your program director. And all of the program directors here have academic support coordinators that help support the program and or program managers. Those are terrific people that you can ask those kinds of questions to. Um, you can ask them about electives. You can ask them about how to get a mentor. You can ask them about how do they get engaged if they're in X degree program versus Y. So they are unbelievably resourceful in helping our students. The other great thing is while we're talking generally about uh, admissions, in this particular webinar, all of our degree program directors hold webinars on a very frequent basis so that you can talk directly to them. And they also engage and involve current students. So you can kind of talk to a current student about uh, the experience that they're having here. How are they learning to network? How are they utilizing career services? So I would strongly encourage you to identify that by going to the program's website. You'll be able to see when their information sessions are. 
and you'll be able to figure out how you can get more detailed program information. Now, if you want to talk about the mechanics, you want to talk to the advising office because they are the people that help you with course registration, with problems around adding and dropping classes, to understanding a degree plan. Did I meet the requirements for graduation? Have I fulfilled the core GPA and um, overall GPA requirements? Because if you come to the Gendal School, in order to graduate, you have to have obtained an overall GPA of 3.0 and a core GPA of your core classes of a 3.0 or higher. So they're really terrific about helping with course registration and all of those uh, issues around the mechanics of getting enrolled and graduated from programs. But you can always send uh, questions um, that you have to, to that office through our JSOM GR advising uh, email address. You can always send questions you have to gendal at utdallas.edu to, to get uh, questions answered to your um, that you might have about registration or degree programs. What type of career support does JSOM offer? I tell you, we just we just put students in a bungee cord from the day that they get here and we shoot them straight into their futures and we make sure that they are really prepared with everything that they need around professional development. We do not want our students going out and being ill prepared uh, to apply for a job or to to talk to an employer or to interview or any of that. So we require all of our incoming master's students to do a professional development class, uh, which is one credit hour. We go over everything from resumes to elevator pitches to LinkedIn profiles to how to how to ace the interviews, to how to network, how to negotiate your salary. We make sure that you are ready and fully prepared, and we do that through that particular course you're required to take. But we also have huge other resources that are available in the Career Management Center. One thing that you'll find here at the Gendal School is that we are so full of acronyms. JSOM means Gendal School of Management. CMC means Career Management Center. Um, so you're going to want to get used to all the different acronyms that are used here in, in our school. But we have an endless supply of resources. We have coaches that are available. Uh, in the Career Management Center for you to walk in and get help. You've got your uh, degree program directors. There are um, advisory boards that advise uh, different uh, degree programs. There are mentoring programs inside of each of our programs. Uh, there are opportunities for mock interviewing. You will not run out of ways to access resources, including 70 plus student organizations that are here in the Gendal School where most of their activities are around engaging with employers. So you have lots of opportunities to practice networking and small talk. Uh, you, I mean, you could do it 24 hours a day, but of course our students do need to sleep occasionally, but there's lots of resources, Norma. Perfect, thank you so much. Those were all of our program questions. So now we'll toss it over to Josephine so we can answer some questions from some of our um, international students. Thank you, Dr. Powell, for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all today. I so enjoy having the opportunity to interact with you all and to be able to answer any questions that you may have so that you understand the immigration components to be able to transition to, to life at UT Dallas. Um, as Dr. Powell said, I'm Josephine Vita, um, and the entire International Student Services Office stands with me to assist you. So please, let's go ahead and get started with the first question. The first question is, how do I contact ISSO? OK, this is great. And you're going to be contacting us throughout your journey, um, throughout your time at UT Dallas. The first thing I want to let you know is that we have multiple avenues for you to contact us, um, and you can find the most efficient way. Live chat is what a lot of students tell us is the fastest, best way for them to get a question. Um, there is a widget on our website, and our URL is on the bottom. And when it's advising time, you'll see the widget and you can log in and speak with an advisor. It is not a chat bot. Uh, it is real live advisors who can read, understand your question and be able to assist you with to, to get the information that you need. If the information you need is more complicated, uh, you can also schedule an appointment. Appointments are going to be 20 minutes in length and you can schedule them. Again, the link is going to be um, found on our website for you to go in and schedule a time that's available and that's uh, 
um, works for you to schedule time to speak with an advisor. So make sure you have all of your questions ready so that you can get through everything and, and leave your appointment with all of your questions answered. A third May, way to be able to get a response or get answers from advisor is to submit an ask an advisor e-form on iComet. Ask an advisor form is just a, a, a form that you submit through iComet. You can type in your question. It goes to the advisor. They can look at your question and your specific academic record and be able to give you a very complete answer um, in response to your question. So those are the three main ways that admitted and prospective students are going to interact with our office. Um, as I said before, the, the information or the links to, to access advising services may be found on an advising website, and the URL is right at the bottom of your screen. All right, we can go to the next question. What is the iComet portal? The portal is a way for you to access advising services and for us to be able to keep track of any queries or questions that you may have so that we can give you complete services in terms of advising. So after you ad are admitted as a UT Dallas student, you'll have all of your credentials as a student ID and your email, uh, rather your net ID. You'll go into iComet and the URL is right there on the bottom. And you're going to use the credentials, the same one that you would use for all of accessing any of UT Dallas uh, digital services to log into iComet. iComet portal has all the e-forms that you're going to need to apply for your I-20, to submit a question through Ask an Advisor, or do a number of services while you're still a prospective student outside the United States, as well as after you arrive in the U.S. Once I'm admitted, how do I apply for my I-20? Great. So the important thing to keep in mind is once you're admitted, you're going to get within 24 hours, you're going to get an email advising you on the steps that you need to take in order to apply for your I-20. But if you forget or you uh, are coming to it later, please know that all that information is outlined on our website. OK, the main eligibility factors is one to be admitted. Congratulations. Um, the second thing is to have a passport. Now, there are very few of you who may not have a passport because of the way um, your country may have rules that you're not going to get a passport until after you have an I-20. Don't let that be a barrier. We are familiar with some of those countries that have those policies, but the vast majority of you, you're going to want to have a passport that's valid um, so long as it's it's got at least six months validity in the future. And if it's a baby picture and you look super cute, that's fine too. The next thing you're going to need to have is sufficient funding to support yourself for one academic year. Your program is going to last longer than that, but what you're going to need for the I-20 as well as for the visa interview is to be able to show that you have liquid funds to support your studies. If you have received the, the scholarship, the Dean's Excellence Scholarship or any other support from the university, that can be used to establish that you have sufficient funds to support yourself in the United States. Our next set of questions have to do with visas, um, so I'll go ahead and just kind of go over them and then you can talk about these these various questions. How do I prepare for a visa appointment? What are the common mistakes that international students might make when they apply for their I-20 or when they have their visa appointment? And what do they do if their visa is denied? Yeah, this is a very pivotal moment and I know that it can be very, it can seem very scary, but we're to help, we're here to help you get over this. And it is, it's just a hurdle. It's not something that's going to stop you on your educational journey. The main things you want to do for a visa appointment are first have your documents ready and second, be able to express yourself and communicate successfully with your visa officer. So in regards to your visa appointment documentation, um, there are many things that are common to all of the embassies. They're going to want your I-20. They're going to want to see that you have your admission letter. They're going to want to see your, your passport. They're going to want to see um, your um, uh, document, any documentation related to your specific program, all of those things are going to be listed on the website of the specific embassy that you are going to be applying for your visa. Many of them are similar to one another. Some countries may have some additional differences, so just make sure you check on that information uh, on their website. The second part of it is being ready to communicate effectively with the visa officer why you chose 
UT Dallas, why you chose this specific program. They want to know that you are a bona fide legitimate student who's interested in pursuing this degree. So be prepared to talk about the degree, the things that you're excited about learning, how you're going to apply that information um, in your, your future endeavors in your career. Right. So those are the two things you want to do is don't script it out. You want to be absolutely natural, but that, those are the two things you really need to prepare in order to have a successful visa interview. Now I am going to for the second question, I'm going to answer the second part about the visa appointment and then I'm going to go back to the I-20. So in terms of uh, uh, places where a visa appointment might become tricky, um, there are two main areas. One is if you are not able to communicate to them that you have the intention to complete your degree and return to your home country after you finish your studies. F1 student status is a temporary immigration category for the specific purpose. So if you go in and you say, I really want to study this and then I'm going to get an H1B and then I'm going to become a permanent resident and then a US citizen and it's going to be great. That is going to be the opposite of what they want you to say because all of those other steps are going to be more permanent immigrant intent. As an F1, you want to be consistent that your plans are to complete your studies and how your degree is going to help you get a job in your home country, start a business in your home country or a third country. OK, so that's number one, that you don't have the intent to permanently immigrate to the United States is something that you're going to need to to watch out so that you don't um, uh, misrepresent to them what you're what you're trying to do. The second thing is is similar to um, what I mentioned earlier is not being able to successfully communicate what it is about this program that really interests you. So all that research that Dr. Powell told you to do, speaking with the program directors and understanding you know what you're really going to gain out of it is going to pay off here because students who cannot communicate that effectively are going to have a hard time overcoming any questions that the visa officer may may bring up. So those are the two things that often cause the most problems. Not being able to show that you're going to be able to go back home and not be able to clearly explain what the what the program of study is. In regard to your I-20, there's one mistake and one one tricky part. Right. So in terms of applying for your I-20, there are very few things that we're looking for. We want your passport and we need to be able to see it clearly. So whatever you upload needs to be something that's legible. And number two is the proof of financial support for the one academic year. And then there's a financial affidavit. Simple things that can be a mistake that cause delays is not including all the documents, not having the documents legible, not having them in English, not having signed the form. Those are simple things that you can edit uh, quickly, but they can delay your I-20 process. The thing that can take, uh, th that can be a little bit harder to overcome is just making sure that your financial documents show a complete picture of your ability to support yourself in the United States. And we have, a, uh, um, we really wanna make sure that we review those things and they're gonna be sufficient for you to not only get the I-20, but be able to satisfy the visa officer um, uh, when you're going for your visa interview. So then the third question is, what do I do if my visa is denied? Well, a lot of people are very scared about this, but the important thing to remember is this is very rare. I think the most we have ever seen is going to be, you know, five or less in a semester, right? And this is out of 2,000, over 2,000 students, and that was a very high semester. There are very few students have visa denials, okay? So um, follow the steps that we just let you know to prepare yourself successfully for the visa process. However, if you do get a denial letter, you should be on the lookout for the documentation they provide you. They should give you a letter that outlines the reason for your visa denial. And that will help us figure out how to help you. Um, we have special advisors and actually it's usually going to be um, Elizabeth Walker, associate director, who can meet with you, go through what you did in the visa process and help you become better prepared in order to apply for a visa interview. Um, it is very rare that there's any restrictions on your ability to apply again. So many times you can you know, find the next slot that is convenient for you to apply for the visa after you've had a chance to uh, correct whatever the issue is and then you can apply again. Most times students are going to be successful that second time that they apply. 
Am I eligible for on campus jobs as an international student? Yeah, so even though you have the financial resources to support yourself, you are absolutely eligible and it is OK for you to get an on campus job. And actually we, we, we recommend it for a variety of reasons. So on campus employment is something that you can do after you arrive in the United States, if you are coming from abroad or if you're a transfer student from another US college or university, you can do that after you have your UT Dallas I-20 and you have arrived on campus. You just need to be in F1 status, which you will be once you arrive. Um, you need to have your I-20, so you still need to be a student after you graduate. You can't work on campus as an on-campus student employee. And you need to make sure you're maintaining F1 status by being enrolled full time in your fall and spring semesters. That's going to be nine credit hours for our graduate students. It's very simple. There's not a very high bar, right, in terms of immigration. Uh, once you're here in F1 status, you are eligible for on campus employment. So reach out to the Career Center, reach out to all of the offices and see what type of employment experience you'd like to have while you're on campus. When will I be eligible for CPT? This is a great question. I know so many of you are interested in getting real world on the job training based on what you're learning in your classes. And that's exactly what CPT is designed for. So the eligibility, a CPT has a variety of eligibility requirements. The thing I want you to understand now or keep in mind right now that CPT regulations as well as CPT policies do change. So I'm going to give you, we're going to point you to where the information is right now. When you arrive on campus, we're going to have more trainings about CPT and you're going to really want to look and see what are the rules and the processes at the time that you're looking to apply for CPT. However, as a general rule, um, in order to be eligible for CPT, you need to be an F1 student who's been lawfully enrolled in classes at UT Dallas or, or um, in the United States for at least one academic year prior to seeking that CPT. There are additional requirements that we have here in related to enrollment in an internship class, your GPA, and a variety of other policies. They're all listed on our website and they're all pretty clear. But again, as I said, some of these things, regulatory and processes may change. Um, so just keep that in mind and keep an eye on this page um, to make sure that you have the latest information. On the right side of the screen, you're going to see a listing of JSON programs that you don't need the one academic year, but you are eligible or you're actually required to engage in a CPT after you've completed 18 credit hours in your program. At that point, you've got a very strong grounding in the core fundamentals of what you're learning, and you can go out into the workplace and successfully represent yourself as a competent professional. So the, the URL for the CPT page is on the bottom. I recommend you have a look at it and if you have additional follow-up questions after you arrive on campus and you're exploring your options, reach out to an advisor and we can talk about your specific case. Thank you so much, Josephine, for answering all those questions. It was great information. Now we will go back to Dr. Powell so that we can take some additional questions that we've received during this webinar. Wow, Norma, Karina, Josephine, myself, we answered a lot of questions. But we are all aware that there's always many more questions that students have that are unique to them. And we encourage you to take this time to put those questions into the chat. And we're going to try and answer as many of those as we possibly can. For those of you that have already submitted questions through chat, um, make a note of what's on your screen. You can always email, um, you can always email your program director to get answers. Uh, but in lieu of anything else, you can email Jendal at utdallas.edu and we answer all types of questions. We also have a live chat and I love what Josephine said earlier. Uh, it's not a bot. We are not a bot either. We actually answer these questions live and we call that our JSOM question desk and you can do that through the link that you see on the screen and um, the question desk people are answering questions all day long. It seems like uh, there is never uh, there's never a shortage of questions around uh, admissions and uh, around all all types of questions that might be important to you as you're a student here at the Jindal School. So I am betting Norma you got a boatload of questions that we now need to answer as a team and I'm going to call out to my colleagues 
when they can help us to answer those questions too. All right. So we Norma, received quite a, got a bunch of questions. <laughs> we do, we do. Um, our first question has to do with some of our application requirements. Um, somebody asked about the work experience requirement and if that can be waived. And then somebody also asked about our letters of recommendation. We require three and they're wondering if any of that can be waived as well. Oh man, that is such a great question. And I'm going to pitch it over to Karina. Karina, I know you get asked this question a lot. And we want to reassure people that the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, we do. And yes is the answer. So for the first part, which is work experience, it is required. Uh, but if you have internship experience or if you have a strong academic record, that is something that uh, could be waived. So if you do not have work experience, don't panic. There may be some um, situations with a st strong academic record that that can be waived. Um, and then I think, Norma, the second part was uh, related to the letters of recommendation. Um, so yes, yeah, so we do require three letters of recommendation. But any candidate who has two years of post baccalaureate work experience only has to submit one letter of recommendation. So technically that's waiving two of the letters of rec that are required. Yeah, and I think it's important uh, to mention that if you've already been admitted with fewer uh, letters of recommendation, you don't have to worry about that. If you've been admitted, that consideration is over. But we are looking for opportunities to waive that criteria, so please don't panic if you're coming out of an undergraduate degree program without work experience. You have that strong academic record. We're looking for reasons to waive that as well as the recommendation requirements for three so that we could admit based off one. So don't panic. You don't need to ask us about either of those. We will review your, your uh, submissions and we'll move forward without, um, if we find that you can be waived, we'll just move forward and waive it. Um, our next question, we've had quite a few people ask about applying for the I-20. Um, should they wait for a scholarship application or a scholarship decision to apply for the I-20 or can they apply after being admitted? So that's a really good question. You know, if, if you get, I would encourage everybody to apply for their I-20 immediately and not wait for a scholarship uh, decision because you can always ask for another I-20, right, Josephine? Yes, that's correct. Um, you can go ahead and apply and then that will actually give you the I-20 number and allow you to start the visa process because you'll have your CBIS ID number. If you later want to, to add the scholarship information to your I-20, you can request the ISSO to do so. But keep in mind, it's not a requirement to update the I-20. You can still go to the visa interview with the original I-20 and with the scholarship letter issued later, and they'll be able to see that the scholarship occurred afterwards and they can, they can see that you have sufficient financial resources with both those sources. Yeah, and if you are awarded a scholarship, we notify the ISSO that that scholarship award was made. So they already know it. You don't have to tell them. They, they get a notification from us that that scholarship opportunity has been given to you. But I don't think you want to wait. You know, we live in a little bit of a tipsy turvy world, and I think you want to get that visa appointment on your calendar and not wait uh, for a potential scholarship award, especially if you have the funding. If you already have the funding, you're set to go. Go do it. Get that visa appointment on the calendar. Um, earlier when we were discussing scholarship, it was mentioned that um, you can defer your enrollment, but you cannot defer the scholarship. So if one does want to defer their enrollment to the spring, would they reapply for spring scholarship or what would that look like? That is such a great question, Norma. Um, so I will be 100% uh, transparent and tell our students that while we award incoming student scholarships in the fall and the spring, uh, and yes, you would need to reapply uh, if you decide to defer, I will tell you that the bulk of our funds are given away in the fall. So it is, it is much more intensely competitive uh, in the spring. So if you've been awarded a scholarship for this fall, you should really try to take advantage of that opportunity. How much time do our students who are admitted have to accept their admission offer? What is the timeline for that? Karina, you get to answer that question. 
Sure. So um, essentially all the way up to the start of the your semester, but that is not the recommendation. Of course, you there's several things that you have to get ready once you are admitted. So if you decide to come to UTD, you should accept your admission as soon as possible. That way it triggers everything else that comes after that. Right. Uh, right. And then registration will be, you know, one of the things that's on your plate. So that's another thing that you have to consider. So if you are wanting to come to UTD and we hope that you are, I would recommend that as soon as you receive your admission to go ahead and accept it. That way, everything that comes after it can start. Yeah, you can get your life in order. I mean, if you are coming from out of state to Texas, you got to worry about finding a place to live. If you're coming from out of the country to Texas, that's a bigger proposition. So I agree with Karina. You want to accept your admission and get the ball rolling to get um, everything arranged for you, whether you are a US based citizen, Texas resident or an international student where you're needing to obtain a visa appointment. Um, for students who are awarded the Dean's Excellence Scholarship, is the tuition waiver for the entire program or for two semesters? Oh, such a great question. The award is for two consecutive semesters. So if you are awarded that for this fall, you would be converted automatically to in-state tuition on your bill uh, for fall and spring, and then you can reapply for continuing student scholarships. Uh, that application deadline is again May 1st of, of next spring. You would apply for awards that we give to continuing students um, with um, many of them coming with in-state tuition waivers. We have a lot of students who come who are not awarded a scholarship in their first year, but then obtain a scholarship in their second year. And so that's really exciting. And I just want to mention Norma, even though I've answered this question in the chat uh, many times, Norma was terrific at putting in a link in the chat. I think it's in the announcement section about a funding your graduate degree webinar that we did. Um, really terrific webinar, way worth your time to watch that webinar where we go over the, the total cost of the program and how to fund the program. You know, a lot of students think that in-state tuition waivers is the only way to do it, and that's a great way to do it. But we have lots of students who come here that obtain campus jobs, which gives them ways to fund living. They get um, TA and RA uh, ships, teaching assistantships and research assistantships after their first semester. Uh, we do not give those to incoming students, but they obtain them in the se second semester based on performance in, in the first semester. That again can give you some great tuition funding opportunities. And then of course, uh, internships for those students that are coming into especially our STEM based programs, business analytics, information technology management, management science, supply chain, those kind of things. Um, you know, those internships are quite lucrative in the pay, you know, uh, averaging sometimes $30, $40 an hour. So, you know, we have students who uh, also on top of that will obtain, um, you know, private loans. And while we can't, you know, endorse a vendor, uh, we do talk about um, in that webinar, some of the vendors our students have told us about where they've had uh, good experiences. So please, if you're trying to, you know, contemplate how do I fund this? Don't think that scholarship is the only way to do it. There are lots of other ways that our students do it very successfully. It is all outlined in that great webinar that Garov Shekhar does. So go find that link in the announcement section. Norma can probably talk about where you can look for that in the sidebar. Go watch it, put it on your calendar, have you and your family watch it, and it'll give you some great ideas if you are especially an international student. Um, we had somebody ask about kind of the size of some of our lar larger programs like business analytics. Um, what are the career prospects for uh, a program like ours that has quite a few students? You know, I love that question. I think that there is this idea that if you come into a large program, you're suddenly an army of people competing for, you know, a handful of jobs. It's actually the opposite. When you have a really big program like we do and bring in lots of information technology management stu students, lots of business analytics students, I will tell you that the recruiters flock to a school where they can hire lots and lots of students as opposed to going to schools that have smaller cohorts where they may only offer uh, an internship or a final OPT position to one student. So a lot of students have that idea that, oh my gosh, you know, the competition is going to be fierce and how am I ever going to land a job? We have, we have 
hundreds, hundreds of students. Uh, you know, if you go on our website and maybe Norma can find our internship stories link. When our students are uh, required to take internship or take an internship, they have to take it for credit or or perhaps non credit if, if the internship is required. Um, those students are required as a part of that internship course to submit an internship story about their experience with their employer. And we post all of that on LinkedIn. Um, it's all out there for you to look at. And if you go through and just look at the thousands, literally thousands of our students who have, you know, interned at all of some of these dream companies you guys have, or even local startup companies, you will see that because we are big, that is our superpower. So don't let that make you think that that is a disadvantage. It's a huge advantage. Um, and, you know, I would encourage you to connect with the program director for some of our larger programs and have that conversation. They'll introduce you to students who can talk about um, the birth of internship opportunities that are out there for our students. And besides that, we're in the fourth largest growing economy in the US and everybody's coming to Dallas and everybody wants to hire our students, especially in a very strong STEM based university that we have or management school that we have and university. Um, thank you, Dr. Powell. It looks like that's all the time we have for questions. I do want to encourage folks to reach out to us at jindal at utdallas.edu if they have any questions that were unanswered, but I want to make sure you have time for closing remarks. Yeah. <clears throat> Norma, first, uh, let me thank my colleagues, um, you know, Josephine, Karina, and Norma, who runs everything behind the scenes. We can't do this without you guys. But I will tell all of you that are you uh, that are looking toward, you know, launching their future by obtaining a, a graduate degree here at the Jendal School. You know, this is a really exciting place. You know, um, it is marvelous to see the eclectic background of all of our students that come from all over the United States and all over the world to be in our graduate programs. You know, you can go to a school and you can get a great degree and you're going to get a great degree from us. But if you come here, you're going to get something much bigger than what just happens in the classroom. We have a highly engaged student population of students who sometimes I feel like they live on campus. Well, live actually in facilities on campus, you know, dorms and apartments, but are in our building sun up to sun down who are developing these great global uh, friendships and relationships. And, you know, our students tell us all the time that you know, we may be a big school, but we do small really well, which means that all of our faculty take an individual interest in our students and in their success. So here you get a lot more than just a really great degree and an opportunity to launch the trajectory of your future, but you get an opportunity to engage uh, with employers, engage with our alumni, um, engage in competitions, uh, have an opportunity to have a really unique experience. And I encourage you to reach out to students uh, that are ahead of you that may have gone to your alma mater that are now a student here or an alum. Um, we've had a long history of recruiting students from all around the world, and it is definitely our pride and joy. So I hope you'll send us your questions if you have any of them. I know um, Josephine's team is ready and at it. I, three times a week to answer those live questions of students in their chat and Karina's team who handles our admissions process. They're in it to win it to make sure that all of your questions are answered. And as Norma said, uh, please send those emails to Jendal at utdallas.edu and we'll get a response back to you. But we really thank you for joining our webinar this morning. We hope you'll be in touch. Um, we can't wait to see your applications. We cannot wait to meet you. So thanks everybody. We'll be in touch again soon.